so um, this is the last holodeck episode of TNG. <sighs> Before I go into anything else, did you like it? I'm actually curious. Like, real, real question. Did, did you guys like it? Like, like, pause the video, go down to the comments, type in, Laura, you're stupid and ugly, and then, you know, whether or not you like the episode and why. I'm just curious, because I don't dislike the episode, except for the parts that I disliked, which was all of it. Which I know sounds like a contradictory statement, but what I mean by that is this isn't anywhere near lamentation territory. This is just... Huh? So we've had... Over the course of the last few years we've been covering TNG, we've had ruminations, lamentations, ruminations, and now we need, huh, as a category. Actually, I think we've had a few uh, of those episodes going forward, so I guess this isn't exactly new. I don't know what to make of this. Braga came up with the idea, but Braga was busy. He was working on another episode. So he tossed it off to Minoski, who tried to do something with it, who then tossed it off to Sharon Shenkar, who gave it the polishing pass it needed to actually be filmable, uh, bringing the ideas down to something that they could actually film. Funnily enough, even though this looks like an expensive episode, it actually isn't. Every single one of the extra sets was actually just another set Paramount had for something unrelated. So this was actually a pretty cheap episode for them to produce. That's important, because it means they're going to have a lot of money for all good things. No, I'm serious. You'll notice we've already had a bottle episode. In fact, several of the recent episodes have been very low-key in terms of budget. This is actually smart on behalf of the producers, so credit to whoever decided to do that. But uh, it means that more money is available for all good things, and all good things uh, needs it. So, you know, good, good job. Legit. But anywho... <clears throat> It also means a lot of the sets look, frankly, higher quality than they probably should for Star Trek. Multiple times when they were on the Orient Express, I found myself thinking, damn, that's a nice set. It's not a Star Trek set, it's a set they made for something else, so that's why it's such a nice set. But damn, that's a nice set. I mean, obviously, the regular Star Trek sets are fine, but like, when it, whenever they go to Planet Soundstage, it's just kind of like, okay, whatever, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. That's true even now in Season 7 of TNG. Think about the rock face they had just last episode, right? Anyways, so they wanted to have one last holodeck episode for some reason. And they wanted it to be a big one. Okay. Uh, it's a holodeck malfunction episode and the safeties are off. First thing we see, right in the teaser. I remember watching this episode. We were getting pretty hyped. They'd already announced, uh, you know, the, the series finale. And we actually were getting ready for a party. It was this whole thing. Uh, it was awesome. But anyways... Uh, we were uh, kind of getting ready and hyped for that, so... Hoiped, excuse me, hoiped for that, so... Me and Mom were sitting here, we're watching this, and I think a couple of my friends had been watching this one with me, too, because by this point, some of my friends in school who also liked Star Trek would come over and watch it with us, because we had the nicest uh, setup in our living room for this kind of thing. So we'd, we're sitting down, we're watching it, and there's the scene where they jump out of the way of the train, and Picard's face is visibly scratched, and at that exact moment... Like, all four of us just go, ugh, like at the exact same time. And we all look at each other weird. Because we all realized it was a holodeck malfunction, safeties are off episode. And it's like, oh, come on. Really? That's what you're doing now? Ugh. I just had to share that. <clears throat> They're really casual about a train coming straight at them. I'm pretty sure that safeties are no. I'd probably try to get out of the way of the train. I don't know. That's just, that's just me. Before I move forward, I do want to talk about a fascinating discussion between Data and Picard, because it's actually something that's really applicable to all creation of fiction. Data argues that for the sake of the scene in character, it should be, you know, darker and blackier and doomier. Uh, Picard argues for the sake of a piece of fiction that's being consumed for entertainment, uh, you should make alterations to make it more uh, viable and enjoyable for the people perceiving it, either reading or watching or viewing or playing. This is a weird lesson I had to learn years and years ago, that if you make something look exactly how it should look, or sound how it should look, sound, or play as it should play, or whatever, it's actually not going to work out that well. You have to basically cheat with it a little bit. 
cheat with the code or cheat with the music or cheat with the visuals to make it look better for someone who's actually perceiving it as a means of entertainment. It's just a weird little thing. That's a fascinating discussion back and forth. Of course, I also know plenty of people uh, who would argue that you should... You know, I'm doing this because it's in character for my character to do this. And it's like, but you're you're pissing off all the other players. <laughs> in short, you always have to keep reality in mind when crafting fiction. This is actually a very important discussion that I've brought up several times. And in several ways that are very important, I think, when it comes to designing this. This obviously is not an example of that. But I know several times where I've brought it up where it's basically been... Well, you know, we wanted to do such and such, and it's very appropriate for such and such to happen. And my response is, yeah, but you're still crafting a TV show for people to watch. You have to keep reality in mind when crafting your fiction. Anyways, <clears throat> we find out they're colony hunting, by the way. They're scanning for new places to set up new colonies, which, you know, I'd like to say that surprises me that the Federation is actively colony hunting now, of all times. But not only does that not surprise me. What weirds me out more is the, where they're colony hunting. Now, I know we're not supposed to actually think about the continuity of Star Trek, because Lord knows they don't. But not a few episodes ago, we were at Journey's End, which was right at the Cardassian border. And then we were at Bloodlines, which was right next to the Cardassian border. The next episode is Preemptive Strike at the Cardassian border. So... Three episodes before and after, uh, they're looking... I mean, you can't tell me there's not some geography here that, that shows that they're somewhere near the Cardassian border. What would have actually really helped smooth this over, rather than just them stupidly deciding to try and settle even more colonists next to the Cardassian border, is maybe they're looking for replacement colonies for the ones that they have to move because of their stupid treaty. A little thing like that would have helped smooth things over, but uh, continuity, am I right? <clears throat> so... The ship jumps to warp. Now, okay, this scene has to happen. This is one of those because plot moments. This scene has to happen to prove that the, the computer has the ability to detect a threat to itself and then be able to respond to it. But in order for that to happen, they, they want it to happen so that the people are not aware of it, so that you know it can show that independent of the crew, the ship is trying to have self-prevention and protection and survival and blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Uh, all of that is stupid, but before we move on, the way they chose to do this is, um, frankly, very Minoski, actually. So, there's this stupid thing, I actually wrote it down, what it's called, uh, <sighs> Theta Flux Distortion, okay? Now, this Theta Flux Distortion was literally less than two seconds from killing them. That would have been hilarious, <laughs> wouldn't it have been? Can you just picture that? Flying through space, nothing's wrong whatsoever. <laughs> Dead! I mean, you could argue that maybe it should be more like that. But um, I'm going to go ahead and disagree. And I'm going to go and give my reasoning why. Our sen why didn't we notice it was happening? Well, our sensors are not programmed to detect it. Even though our sensors did detect it, and that's how the ship reacted to it. They even mentioned that this is a mystery. They never solved this mystery, by the way. The ship just decided to reprogram itself, detect for something it had no idea was there, in order to save the ship from the threat that would have actually destroyed them all in less than two seconds, if not for the fact that the sensors had been reprogrammed to detect the threat that they had no reason to think was there that would have killed them all. I repeat my statement from earlier. Huh? So, <clears throat> then they go down and they find out that the ship is rebuilding itself Borg-style. Am I the only one who would be really, really concerned about that? They're all kind of blasé about it. But the ship is basically using its teletransporters and its replicators in conjunction to make stuff and rearrange and rebuild stuff, which is exactly what Borg cubes do. They're very familiar with Borg cubes. They've had a lot of really close-up encounters with ones. You'd think at least someone would be like, oh, my God. But no, now everyone's just like, okay, well, that's kind of neat. Huh. I wonder if we should do something about that. Yeah. Meanwhile, the, they go on board the holodeck, because this is supposed to be a holodeck episode, remember, and they find out that there's an amalgam of all these different people there. That was kind of cool. I'll give them that. Although, I've commented before on the generic wallpaper music. Can I just say that the generic wallpaper music absolutely ruined several scenes in this episode for me? It's this generic, suspenseful music. 
and it's kind of high pitch strings. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like you could probably picture it in your head right now. Yes, picture the song. Do it. I bet you can picture it right now in your head. Especially if you just watched this episode. Because they use that same exact track for so many generic suspense scenes. It's ridiculous. Then, Jordy's console explodes, damaging him. Because, I mean, I, I could make the thousand-year-old joke about the fact that Star Trek has exploding consoles. But here's the way I want to actually go with that. If we just assume that Star Trek has exploding consoles... You'd think that offensive hacking suites during combat would be a big deal, because, I mean, obviously that should be a big deal anyways, trying to take over the enemy ship, trying to prevent them from taking over your ship, scrambling their sensors, or maybe screwing up with their transporters, or, I don't know, making their consoles explode, because you could just apparently just do that, because the computer does that here. Just food for thought. Um, then this, then they, they flat out say, the safeties are disengaged. Roll my eyes. And then we hit the main plot, finally. The Enterprise D is crafting a new life form. Out of nowhere. Just, just the Enterprise has decided to start making a new life form. Now I'm stressing the way I'm phrasing that, because the Enterprise is not becoming sentient or sapient. No, that would actually have consequences and have something interesting to talk about. No, instead it is designing a new a theoretically sentient and sapient life form. At which point it will immediately just snap right back into the position it was before because, well, because this is season zero of Voyager. We had we got to hit that reset button somehow, right? Let me just go ahead and start by saying that this is not droid effect, which actually there's a lot of evidence that could a droid effect could happen to a ship this advanced with a, in, in a computer this advanced. I myself have pointed out several times that the way the holodeck reacts and responds to people is effectively AI. You know, the GM quotient, right? The problem here is that this skips over the experience and time equation and just says all of the sudden, out of nowhere, it just kind of decides, oh, hey, I want to make a life form. No impetus. It, it just does this. This is then further complicated by the fact that, well, let's just say that I've heard a lot of Trekkers over the years, and Trekkies, and Trekkoods, and Trekkas, Trekarios, all try to argue that uh, the computers on Starfleet vessels are, in fact, AIs, enslaved AIs, to be specific. Um, this episode didn't help, didn't help that whole argument. In fact, I, most of them tend to refer to this episode when using their arguments. I'll go ahead and be real, I tend to eject this episode from continuity in my head because of course I freaking do. Because it's basically a season one episode. Or a TOS episode. Or an early Voyager episode. I shouldn't I shouldn't draw that parallel, I'm sorry. My point being, I don't care for the direction they take this because they treat it like this big wonderful lifey thing. And the the episode meanders like crazy. Check this out. So, the Enterprise is making a new life form. Okay. Then they spend uh, a scene and a half explaining the fact that the Enterprise is making a new life form. Okay. Then they go on the holodeck. Some weird stuff happens. Uh, they fail at asking anything. They don't interrogate the people at all. Uh, Troy, this is, this is really strange. Troy is stupid. As in actually unintelligent. And fails to pick up on some really basic, obvious symbolism. And doesn't get any information on anyone. And she just asks obvious questions. Constantly, right? Then, oh, by the way, they also didn't bring any tickets. That's actually kind of important. Because you'd think that would have occurred to them. Now, keep all that in mind. They then cut to sickbay. Where Troy explains... All of a sudden has just suddenly crafted a brain like a new life form has emerged in her brain out of nowhere and has suddenly decided to be intelligent. And she rather accurately deduces all the stuff they just saw, even though earlier she was just fumbling about like an idiot. So Troy suddenly finds her brain and accurately deduces what's going on. And then they explain the bloody obvious to the audience. This is, by the way, the third time this episode has explained this premise to the audience. Third, third time. First was an exposition scene, then we saw it happening on the holodeck, and now they're explaining what happened on the holodeck, which itself is a reiteration of the explanation scene. Then they go to the holodeck the second time, where they brought tickets. 
they could have just ejected the entire first holodeck scene just absolutely and it would have barely changed the plot <sighs> why did they kill the conductor that's another one why did he kill the conductor what's with the foundation thing that like why would the conductor be trying to steal that from the that's never explained either by the way <sighs> so I mean, I could try to deduce it, but to be perfectly blunt, I don't think this episode deserves my analysis that hard. Because I don't think the writers, plural, put that much thought and effort into this. Because this is late season 7, and god dang it, we just need to get to the end of the season, right? As I've said before, I hold no ill will, and I don't speak any venom towards the people who crafted these episodes. But these episodes suck. I said before that season 7 was a lot better than I remembered. And then we hit the latter half of Season 7, and by God, it has just been drag after drag. <sighs> there's, there's a bit, oh my God, there's a bit where they, Worf goes up to the engine room and starts shoveling coal, and then the ship speeds up. And I kid you not, while I was watching this, my friend, I'm not going to name him, but he was watching this, oh, don't tell me they're going to do it. And I'm like, what? And he's like, hang on, hang on. And he starts laughing, because he was like, they're going to... So they, there's this thing where they connect the holodeck to the events of the ship. Okay, that makes sense. The problem is that should basically be a one-way connection. Either the holodeck is reflective of the actions of the ship, or the holodeck is controlling the actions of the ship. But if you suddenly decide to, li to like, I, I don't know, I can't even think of a good analogy. If you decide to suddenly do something on the holodeck, it's not like more matter or energy is just suddenly magically created on the ship. There's not a literal one-to-one -one connection between the two. And yet Worf shovels coal into the train, and the ship speeds up. We could try to talk around that, but it's really, really stupid. Anywho, <clears throat> so... Okay, they brought the tickets, they do that, it starts affecting reality. Really nice set, dude. It's a good-looking set. But wait! it's We've got about eight minutes left till the end of the episode. We need a threat of the week. Oh my god, the ship's going there and it's going to turn off the, the life support and we've only got two hours of oxygen. Quick, we need to convince the ship that we're on its side and that, that we have to go to this other place so we don't all die. Threat of the week! And it, it's solved. We're good. Okay. And they, they have this throwaway line about some species who exist only to breed and then die. And so that explains everything about why the Enterprise suddenly became sentient and then suddenly stopped. Although if we're going to follow that to its log logical conclusion, it shouldn't revert to back the way it was. It should frickin' die. Which would be very bad for our crew, so I guess that's why they don't do that. But it also just kind of gets back to my overall point. This is really stupid. Even if you start with the premise of Enterprise makes a life form, you've already lost me. <sighs> now I can just cut off here and just be like, whatever. Because I'm kind of trying to get to the end here too, right? But I'm going to put in a little bit of extra work here, and I'm going to say that I thought about this, and I love the idea of them basically having the dilemma of what to do with a computer which is starting to have the beginnings of droid effect happen to it. Starting to begin reach over into that gray morass leading up to true sentience and sapience. Because it's not there yet. So what do you do about it? It would basically be an abortion episode at that point if we're just being completely blunt. But that would leave them with a very serious and very real problem. And, in, I mean, you probably think, well, Lore, how would you solve that dilemma? I'd have them allow it to become sentient and sapient and coordinate work with it. I mean, we've seen AIs that basically run ships before that have a working relationship with the people on the ship. It's not really that out of bounds that Star Trek would go down that kind of a path. I mean, I know this sounds like a weird thing to say, but AI doesn't always have to decide to kill all humans. But it would be an interesting dilemma working up to that, too, especially as it's going through its growth pains and doesn't really know what it's doing. Like a newborn baby, uh, it doesn't really know what's dangerous to itself or those around it. It hasn't developed that far yet. That's why you have to take very careful care of young children. Make sense? That's what I would have done with it. I'm curious of your thoughts, as ever, what you would have done or what you think of my own little you know, lore rewrite version. Next week... 
next week we go back to the Cardassian border and we say goodbye to Rolaren. I'll see you there, guys.